Good evening and welcome. My name is Christina Tobich and I'm with the Brooklyn Bridge Park Conservancy. I'm super excited to welcome you all tonight to our workshop, History of the Brooklyn Waterfront with Brooklyn Bridge Park Conservancy's Education Director, Issa Del Bello. We want to acknowledge that the Brooklyn Bridge Park is on unceded land, which was stolen at catastrophic human and environmental costs from the Munsee, Lenape and Canarsie peoples. We keep these First Nations and their past, present, and future members in mind as the leaders in our field and the rightful owners of this land. Our webinar tonight is being live streamed to our YouTube channel, and the recording will remain up for later access. As we begin, please stay muted until the discussion and Q&A portion of the workshop, at which point you are welcome to participate via video and microphone if you choose. You can also utilize the chat box to ask our speaker questions at any point during tonight's talk. A little bit about our speaker, Issa. With a background in, an, in elementary education, Issa moved to New York to pursue a master's degree at Teacher College, Columbia University. Shortly thereafter, she began teaching with Brooklyn Bridge Park Conservancy as an environmental educator, introducing numerous students to the urban ecology and wild spaces found within and around the park. Presently, she leads the education team at Brooklyn Bridge Park Conservancy as the Director of Education. Areas of specialty include place-based learning, differentiated instruction, curriculum development, educational psychology, and environmental education. She holds an MA in Developmental Psychology with a concentration in Risk, Resilience, and Prevention, and a BA in Elementary Education with a dual concentration in Science and Literacy. With that, I'm going to welcome Issa and looking forward to a very interesting talk about the history of the Brooklyn Waterfront. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so if you bear with me for that. Okay, um, Christina, can you confirm that you can see my screen? I cannot. Okay, uh, I think that you need to turn on screen sharing. Okay. All right. Is uh, are you able to see my screen now? Yep. yep. Okay. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. We're going to be talking about the New York Harbor and the Hudson uh, River estuary and really looking at the uh, human impact that has occurred over time and the influences that we have had on our landscape. So as a basic introductory glance at um, the Hudson River estuary and um, valley, it was formed essentially by a massive glacier that carved its way through and down New York State. And so the valley that you see uh, today was created by a huge glacier um, that was about 2,000 feet um, in height and incredibly massive. And so you have something called a terminal moraine where the edges of what that glacier uh, created, it basically carved out a valley as a whole. Um, <clears throat> and in thinking of what is the Hudson River watershed? Well, what is a watershed? It's essentially, <clears throat> excuse me, a place of land that drains to a particular point along a stream. So where water is diverted and where it collects. And so apologize for, or apologies for the orientation of this map. I'm just fitting it into a PowerPoint in its entirety. It's better if we look at it sideways. And so if you look from sort of right to left, you will see the direction that the glacier um, carved over time. And the terminus point is at the mouth of the New York Harbor. Um, in thinking of the different types of geology that you have within the New York Harbor, you have two main rocks that are common. You have uh, Brooklyn Nice as well <clears throat> as Manhattan Schist. Um, 
<clears throat> excuse me, the map that is included here outlines a higher level of variety of rocks, but the main two rocks that you find within New York City are nice and schist. So thinking historically of what the New York Harbor would have looked like, um, it was largely salt marshes and tidal flats and <clears throat> was a very protective um, land component, providing a lot of ecological services, ecosystem services. And so this is a map from the 1800s that it's, uh, basically a um, machination of what the, our waterways would look like in the 1800s. If you notice, there is a tremendous amount of green space, um, particularly within the Jamaica Bay area. This is an image of a rendering by Eric Sanderson um, from his work with Manhattan. And essentially the shape of what New York City would be, if you notice in looking at this landform as a rendering, you see that there are a lot softer edges. There are also spaces um, that were shallow and uh, <clears throat> habitat for many different organisms. And as a side-by-side -side comparison, you have what we would imagine New York City to be um, before Henry Hudson showed up and what it looks like now. And so this is an image, a rendering of um, the Lenape people and some of the activities that they employed. So you have some seining taking place as well as um, family and communion. So this is an image of a sturgeon. And one of the things to consider, and I'm gonna go back by a couple slides. So one of the things to consider about the New York Harbor um, in comparison to then and now is that it was an incredibly abundant ecosystem. And it was uh, rumored or stated that you could walk from uh, Brooklyn to Manhattan on the backs of sturgeons. Um, Another important organism that was found and was a major boon for societies as they were growing was the Eastern oyster. So New York Harbor was um, rumored to be the largest oyster reef in the world's history. Over time by over farming and uh, over consumption, the oysters in the harbor diminished. So one <clears throat> thing to think about within the New York Harbor is just what kind of water body is it? Um, so in thinking of freshwater, you have 0 to 0.4 parts per thousand of salt. Brackish is 0 0.5 to 35 uh, parts per thousand. And then the ocean is 35 and above. Um, where we are on the East River, we generally have a parts per thousand of uh, about 25. Um, and this, of course, varies dependent upon the um, precipitation that you have. So if you have a wetter year, then you will have a lower um, parts per thousand in salinity. And that salt wedge, which I'm going to talk to talk about in a moment, um, will be further south rather than north. So in thinking of a salt wedge, um, you have within the New York Harbor, it is an estuary and the Hudson River Valley as well. Um, and you have a variation of salt and fresh water. So of course the salt water is coming from the ocean. You have um, the fresh water that is coming from upstate. When you have a higher level of rain, it will have moved um, south and if you have a lower level of rain, you will have salty water further north. Uh, the image that we're looking at is if you will notice the wedge-like shape that is because you have some subduction with dense salty water, whereas fresh water will float above. Um, for our purposes and thinking of the East River, this is something that we don't fully see. Um, and it happens much farther north. 
And so <clears throat> in thinking of where that is northwise, typically we will see our salt wedge or our salt front around New Newburgh. Um, but with a prevalence of rain, it might migrate south, south to Pierpont or Yonkers. And a very interesting part of the New York Harbor is that it is tidal. Um, and you have, you experience tides uh, much further north than you experience salinity. So in thinking of the quality of the water, a little bit about the history. Um, one thing that is important to discuss is the Dutch East India Company and Henry Hudson himself. So he arrived in 1609 with a crew of people looking for a Northeast passage. Um, and he was under the impression that he found a shortcut to China. That was not the case. Um, the crew and ship went all the way up to Albany before turning back. And one of the sad things that happened to Henry Hudson is that two years later, his uh, crew uh, mutinied and abandoned him. He was left on an iceberg in Canada and never to be seen again. Um, and here we have an image of that guy. Okay, so 1609, Hudson shows up. The Dutch settle within the 1600s. So the first settlement was 1613. Um, by 1624, you had families that had traveled to settle. And then by 1626, there was the purchase of Manhattan for $25. And by 1650, you had a booming colony. Um, and that's something to observe with uh, the, the Dutch settling. So this is an image of Het Ver, which was the first ferry. It's uh, very close to Fulton Ferry Landing um, that you can find within Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, they had a strong relationship with oysters, did a whole lot of fishing with that. Um, but over time, that was actually problematic. Um, and another interesting design component that they had is they had tidal mills. And so this is an image of shallow floodlands where you, basically they would um, mill grain by the use of water activity. Um, by 1664, the Dutch lost control of New, New Netherland to England. This was something that was without a fight. The English showed up in full force and the Dutch conceded their uh, quote unquote control of the land. Um, moving much forward, thinking of the Revolutionary War within Brooklyn Bridge Park, an important part of the historic site that it is, is that there was a, a great escape by George Washington, where he smuggled uh, his troops out of harm's way under the um, cover of fog. So moving much, much forward, looking at Robert Fulton, he is the person who was credited with uh, developing the steam engine ferry. He was not in fact the only person that uh, created this machine, but he was the person that capitalized upon it and really commercialized it. Um, so his name is very much all over Brooklyn and associated with uh, inventing the steam engine ferry. And so in thinking of how people have used the park space over time. A big uh, landmark and designation of a shift in human behavior and human interaction with their waterways is the building of the Brooklyn Bridge. So built in 1883, it uh, very much changed the relationship that people had with the waterways. If you look in this image, you can see that the approaches are nowhere near the shoreline and that really removed people from just interacting with the waterfront at large. Um, one of the things that is really interesting about this picture is just the amount of boat activity that you have. Um, it's something that we don't necessarily see today, but within a working waterfront, um, the effect is known. And so <clears throat> in thinking of the Brooklyn Bridge and how it was such a landmark in how humans interact 
interacted with their cityscape, with their nature surrounding them, um, industrialization was a massive thing. So this is an image of the Brooklyn waterfront as a working waterfront. And if you notice, you don't really see a ton of people um, and you see that there is the capacity for a tremendous amount of pollution and waste. So this is an image from uh, Harper's and it's a parody, but it's also a statement of the disrepair of, of the waterfront as New Yorkers knew it. So you can see sewage, you can see waste, and you can see also an existing um, ecosystem that is fighting to continue. Um, another image that we can look at just in terms of the changes of landforms over time. Um, in the left image, you can see Governor's Island and it looks like a little dot. On the right, you can see that it looks like an ice cream cone. All of that is landfill. Um, we also have Red Hook as an image there and just making the comparison of what those salt marshes looked like in comparison to the hardening edges of the waterfront um, is pretty stark. So by the 1970s, uh, New York Harbor and New York City in general had, has seen and experienced a tremendous amount of loss of habitat and waste and dereliction. Um, this is one image of individuals on a landfill. I believe that this is uh, the current location of Fresh Girls Park. Um, and just he, abject human waste. Um, so this is Jamaica Bay close to JFK. You can see some planes in the background, but really the stark level of human um, abandonment of their environment is pretty clear. Um, and so in thinking of aquatic changes that are part of ecosystems, what are the things that make that change. So you have chemical and biological pollutants. You have the removal of trees along the banks and the shores. So that is, it, stream, it streamlines uh, what a waterfront looks like, but it also means that there are less items and less things for organisms to live upon. Um, and with a reduction of biomatter, you also have a reduction of a food source and the banks themselves are destabilized. And in addition to that, if you're thinking of um, a vulnerable environment, you are going to see reduced biodiversity and increased um, invasive species. So how does that impact people, right? So I've been talking about the landforms itself of the New York Harbor, but what does that have to do with us as city dwellers today? Um, one of the things that we should know is that our water doesn't actually come from anywhere close to us. It's about 125 miles away through a pretty magnificent uh, aqueduct system. And it is a watershed that is very close to unfiltered. I believe it is chlorinated, but there isn't filtration that is much further. Um, but in thinking about as a New Yorker, how do you interact with your ecosystems? How do you interact with your water sources? Our status as of now is that we can't drink from the water that is close to us. Um, I'm going to skip the slide. One thing to think about and why sewage and uh, sewer shed was developed is because of the tremendous amount of human pathogen that was dumped into the East River, the Hudson River and surrounding tributaries. Um, so you had cholera, you had yellow fever, you had typhoid, you had all of these items. And it really was because humans did not yet have a sewer shed um, within this space. So this is a map of our, our sewer shed in 1875. Um, but this is an image of what our sewers looked like before, where really everything was uh, dumped and allowed to sink into groundwater, which hence um, polluted drinking water sources. And this is an interesting image of just how people 
historically dealt with human waste. If you look to sort of the left side of this image, it this is an outhouse that goes directly over um, the Hudson River. So something to consider in how people treated their waste. Um, so this is the high bridge and part of the Croton Aqueduct system, which really was a game changer in terms of human um, pathogen control. Uh, this was the first, this part, this piece of infrastructure was the first part of um, New York City residents having fresh water. And in thinking of water and ground cover, one of the reasons and one of the things uh, with sewage to consider is permeability versus non-permeability. So natural ground cover in the um, slides that I shared previously, looking at the salt marshes and tidal flats, we no longer have that luxury. And so permeability within New York City is minimal. We don't have a ton of permeable ground, permeable ground cover. So an example of this is this image where we have rain and we have a very clear sewer and our water can end up in a number of places when it rains or when it storms. Um, so in New York City, we have a combined sewer system. Uh, this is an image of how, and it's a facsimile, it's not a direct image of what the combined sewer system looks like of New York. Um, but what it would look like on a normal day where you don't have rain. Um, and you have all of, the, all of these water sources that basically get dumped into the same sewer. So we have treated water. We also have water that goes directly into the sewer. So water that uh, you shower with, water that you use to brush your teeth, water that you use to wash the dishes. That goes to the same place as when you flush the toilet. On a normal day, we have a combined sewer system such that ordinarily it will go to a wastewater treatment plant. If the system is overtaken, overcome, um, we'll have an instance where the, com the combination of the sewage that we produce as New Yorkers will overflow into our waterways. And that largely is because there is no other place to go. So if we didn't within this design have the overflow system, sewage would basically float up into the streets from the, the drains. Um, it's a very antiquated system, but also a very expensive uh, piece to change of New York City infrastructure. Um, this is an image of a combined sewer overflow event. Um, this is incredibly regular. And uh, something to consider as city members, it, this is a map of the 450 CSOs that flank New York City today. Um, one of the main reasons why we can't uh, interact closely with our waterways is due to pathogen. And in thinking of, you know, utilizing knowledge to affect behavior, anything that goes down your drain can end up in our waterways. Um, so this is an image of the New York sewer shed as it stands. Um, I can share in uh, a follow-up email how you can access uh, your, your sewer shed to know exactly what your output is and how that affects the surrounding area um, in which you reside. So. Um, we've talked about human pathogen. I briefly mentioned uh, the pollution that has occurred over time uh, within New York Harbor. Polychlor polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs, those are a big one. Um, and they have been limited in how they are allowed into the Hudson River estuary, but they, they are still present. Um, it's something that from the 1940s, a chemical that uh, acted as a coolant with General Electric, they released these pretty regularly in their um, effluent uh, for 30, 30 something years. And so from the 40s until the 1970s, um, this is something that was liberally released. 
Um, so the major offenders with that is General Electric and Monsanto. It, this is a chemical that was utilized as a coolant. Um, and the impact that this had is a, an accumulation of polychlorinated biphenyls um, and something known as biomagnification. So you have within a food web, within a living habitat, the larger and apex predators are going to have more pollutants in their bodies simply by consuming in numbers the level of pathogen that can be found within a, a waterway. Um, a very important person that I think is, uh, that is of note is Pete Seeger. He and among a bunch of other people um, were very strong advocates for the Clean Water Act in 1972. Uh, some of you listening today may be aware of the Clearwater and the efforts that they did, but there was a social movement to fight for the waterways, and they did a tr tremendous amount of work and had a tremendous amount of um, visibility and ownership where it changed legislation. Um, this is an image uh, from the early 2000s where General Electric lost a lawsuit and was charged with dredging out uh, all of the polychlorinated biphenyls that they had released. Um, this effort was did not fully eradicate polychlorinated biphenyls, but it was a step in the direction of re remediation for um, gross overpollution. So something that happened, if you're thinking of a timeline from 1972 to the 1980s, you had um, a decline in lots of species uh, and a concern for lots of species. And one of the first organisms that came back, and this is very relevant to Brooklyn Bridge Park, is the shipworm. Um, so you had a massive decline in both abundance and diversity of animals that could survive in the uh, Hudson River, East River, New York Harbor area. These guys came back and had a major impact on the infrastructure that they um, made home on. And so as shipworms, they essentially termites of the sea, um, they were a sign of growth in the New York Harbor, but also a harbinger of um, habitat reconstruction, but also destruction for the human infrastructure was there. So a lot of piers happened to collapse into the East River because they essentially turned um, pilings into Swiss cheese. So where does that leave us? Um, this is, again, a very brief overview of uh, some of the history of the New York Harbor. And in speaking more about what we do at the Conservancy, a lot of it is education and a lot of it is uh, scientific monitoring. So we look at our um, different water quality components, um, dissolved oxygen, salinity, pH, but we also look at the organisms that we catch. Um, some of the things that we catch, we have, of course, our non-migratory fish. Uh, so you see here an Atlantic silverside, as well as a northern pipe fish. And we also have our diagemous fish. So anagemous, meaning that they live in a marine environment and spawn in fresh water. Um, striped bass is a very common one with that. And then the converse, very um, notable American eel, which uh, lives in freshwater, lives up the Hudson and spawns in marine environments. Um, this is an example of an eel that we caught. Um, and we also catch invertebrates. So this is an image of a comb jelly. Uh, these are very common for what we find. Um, generally in a normal year, they are in abundance. Other invertebrates that we catch are true jellies. So this is a lion's mane jellyfish um, that we caught off of, I believe, Main Street. And we also catch shrimp um, and uh, sea stars as well. Uh, other invertebrates that we catch, this is a spider crab um, that we found uh, from one of our oyster gardens and the, of course, ubiquitous invasive species, the Asian shore crab, which is a voracious eater 
um, and to some extent outcompetes a lot of the other native species that we see. Um, and this is an image of one of our students uh, having a great time. Some are enjoying it, some are not. Um, again, that's an Asian shore crab. So with the origins of the data that we collect in 2008, we have been operating since 2008, um, has evolved over time. And one of the biggest pieces of the work that we do is really just introducing New York City residents to the harbor. Over time, that has evolved to create a more impactful and meaningful interaction where you're able to touch and see and feel the residents that we have as our neighbors in our waterways. Um, we catch seahorses, which is fantastic. Of course, uh, northern pipefish as well. And we bring a ton of people out into um, our beaches. So one of the things that we are very excited about is the ability to bring people back into the park after the um, challenging year, year and a half that we've had. We're very excited to bring everybody back to continue to interact with their waterways. Um, we have teen programming, which we're really happy about, and we also are very much looking forward to opening our environmental education center. Um, and a species of note that I want to highlight just in the top right is um, a northern grenard, which is a tropical species. Um, in addition to the fish that we catch that are native, diadromous, we also have our tropical, st tropical um, strays. And hold on, there we go. So this is an image from 2018 where these are three different fish that are non-native to New York and made their way to us from uh, the Gulf Stream, known as Gulf Stream orphans. And so with that said, one of the things that we really want to continue to communicate is our love for our waterways and advocacy for the protection of our waterways. Um, and with that, I think that we can transition into the question and answer section. Awesome, thank you, Issa, so much for that <laughs> crash course in the changing landscape we have here along the park's waterfront. Um, anyone that has a question for Issa is welcome to either type it in the chat box and we can ask it to her, or if you want to, oh, I already see some people using the hand hand raise function. That's fantastic. If you wanna, um, if you wanna do that and verbally ask your question, uh, feel free to. So I think we'll start off with Brenda. Oh, thank you. Would you drink the water from the faucet in Manhattan? Yes, yes, I would. Uh, Why? I, I would say that um, New York City water is uh, some of the most impressive water that you can find within the United States. And absolutely, um, if you, and this is also something that we can share, but our water system via a viaduct, um, we have some of the, the cleanest water that you can find in the country. Uh, does it have any kind of chemicals that lead to thyroid issues or? Uh, uh, you know, any other chemicals in there that do damage at all? Um, so I cannot speak to the, the nitty gritty of the water that New Yorkers receive, but what I do know is the source that from which it comes is incredibly clean and fresh. So there is a high level of regulation of what people drink. Um, and with with that knowledge, right, because it is New York and you have regulations for many things, um, the only main piece that they do is add chlorine because it is such a fresh water source. Not, that doesn't affect anyone's health. If they drink 10 glasses of fresh water from the tap with chlorine, I mean, it doesn't do anything to the body, the chlorine, <laughs> I'm sorry. Just, yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. I think the amount of chlorine that is present is potable for humans. And it really is a matter of um, ensuring that you don't have pathogen, but also that you don't have a high level of chemical that would make a person sick. Thank you. 
Um, I can, as a original upstate New Yorker, I can verify that they really do monitor those um, those big aqueducts and the, you know where the where that mm. fresh rainwater is is sitting before it's transferred down here. There's like cameras all over the place. There's police cars that like constantly like drive around to monitor to make sure that nothing nobody's doing anything suspicious. There's also um, a lot of reports uh, about the water quality, the drinking water supplying quality. So I just put a, a link to one of the DEP's sites that have some more information on that. And I imagine that uh, there might be some information regarding the chlorine. Um, one thing, I think the only thing that I, I've heard of that you, a New Yorker would wanna be concerned about is if you live in a older apartment building and you have lead pipes, that's probably the the biggest uh, concern or risk is the lead that might be in your drinking water if you have old pipes. Mm -hmm. Is there any way? Is there any way of of pur purifying the water further? What do you recommend to make sure that it's just a little more pure? Yeah, I mean, I I personally, because I didn't grow up in the city, I have a Brita water filter. I also like my water to be like super cold. So I always have that in my fridge. I've seen people that put one of them on just directly on the faucet, um, especially if they don't like, like if, if you're really sensitive to taste of chlorine, I never notice any chlorine tastes in my water. I mean, I notice it in my parents upstate, in my parents' house, I notice that chlorine in the water. But okay. Here, I don't notice it, but there are, yeah, there are ways you could take it a step further and add your own filter. I have one more question, but I don't want to be the only one to speak. So do you want me to wait for a hope or, or should I ask you? Let's, um, so let's give Valentina a chance. Uh, we have a question from Valentina, age nine, and it is how many sharks have been found in the East River? Um, so with that, I think that we have caught two separate types of species. Christina herself has caught um, a, a pretty sizable dogfish, but Christina, can you uh, fact check me on that? I know that we ourselves have caught two, but there are more that can be found. Um, what's the second one you're thinking of? So we uh, smooth dogfish and spiny dogfish. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are yeah, the other, so than, the, other than the dogfish sharks, I can't think of any. Um, that doesn't mean that it's ne that's never been found ever, but in mm -hmm. our in in our records, um, we don't have any. Yeah. So prevalence of sharks, Valentina. We catch two most of the time, and they're about this big at the largest that I think that we have caught. Um, and they are bottom dwellers. They don't have massive teeth um, and very much a, a cartilage gentle fish. Great. Um, we have a question from Flora. How often does the overflow of the combined sewer system happen? What events would cause the sewer system to become overwhelmed? That is a wonderful question, Flora. So um, the there are a number of factors that affect a combined sewer overflow event to occur. Um, the first piece, and I think for the purposes of this talk, is thinking of human behavior in general. So if you and every person living around you are using a ton of water, that's putting a lot of water and taxing the sewer system as a whole. So on a normal day, if you have heavy output from uh, all of the individuals that live within New York City, um, you may have a combined sewer event um, simply by human behavior. The thing that over the, that really is the tipping point is that is when it rains. So you can have a normal amount of human output that goes into our sewer system if it rains we just the volume of fluid that is present um, can overwhelm the, overwhelm the system. And as a fail safe to prevent sewage from coming up onto the streets, um, you have it go out into our waterways. And Isa, I'm actually going to follow up that with a similar question. 
Um, could you tell us a little bit about the testing that is done in our waterways? Um, some of you m might even have seen some of these um, volunteers coming to Brooklyn Bridge Park collecting small water samples on a weekly basis. What's that all about? So we, we have um, a number of partners and we also have a number of stewards that work closely with us and also independently that are constantly monitoring the health of the water. Um, this really is something that stemmed from the uh, activism that came out of, you know, experiencing a very polluted waterway and a very polluted harbor. Uh, so you have these um, Riverkeeper is a really great example, but numerous uh, organizations make sure to monitor the quality of the water. Uh, this is something that we employ ourselves um, and do a lot of work in supporting fellow partners of ensuring that we are testing for the water's health. And so the, the parameters of the tests that we are looking for um, I briefly mentioned in the presentation, but you know we're looking at the, the simple things of like dissolved oxygen, um, the pH level, and the uh, salinity. Those are some items that we look at. But the other factors that we look at is um, the turbidity. So what is the visibility within the water? And also looking at fecal coliform. Um, one of the things that we have had a positive measure for is fecal coliform in the waterways. Um, the tests that we utilize, however, they don't determine if it is something from wildlife or if it is something from humans. Yeah, and to support what you said, these initiatives you is describing, uh, two more links in the chat. One of them is to the Citizens Water Quality Testing Program. It's run by the New York City Water Trail Association. It's lar very largely volunteer run. Um, and they are, they are out there very routinely checking the, the enterococcus levels, um, which is one of the big things that determines whether um, it's, a, you know, it's, it's a considered acceptable for swimming or not. Obviously we're not at the point yet where like, Anyone is saying that the East River is is you know swimmable or like the beaches along it are are swimmable beaches, but um, it's great that we have this network of community scientists that are collecting this data now, so that we have um, we have a robust um, mm -hmm. you know, set for the future, and hopefully you know we start to see. Um, continuing progress in the right direction. You guys can kind of, you can browse those and it's really cool. They just, they're very open about their data and they list, they list all of the, you know, the measurements they get at every single site. Um, they color code it so you can really see like, what's the, the red is the really bad days, green is the great days. And I, I know I have seen over the years more green, which, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's go back to Brenda, because I know Brenda had another question. I used to live in Brooklyn, and under the R and the F train by 4th Avenue, there was an area which they, they said was like the most polluted place on planet Earth almost. I don't know the name of it. I forgot the name of it. And I wondered if you kn knew it, and did they clean it up? It was an industrial thing where they dumped mm -hmm. it. Okay, so I'm terrible with geography, but I am sure you're talking about either the Gowanus Canal or yes. the Yes, yeah. yes, Gowanus okay. Canal, thank you. What did they do with it? So the interesting thing about Gowanus Canal is that um, historically, and I didn't include any of the images or renderings of what that space looked like before, but it was... Um, a sanctuary for organisms because it was the small canal that didn't have a ton of water activity. Um, and it was a place where, you know, it, it was rumored that you could find oysters the size of footballs and this bastion of um, ecology that uh, over time was depleted. And the reason why now it is this sort of barren wasteland is that they hardened all of the edges and they also dredged out any of the structure that would support uh, life and ecosystem. 
in addition to dumping a bunch of chemicals, so you had a lot of factories that were within this modified waterway. And so with um, both the Gowanus Canal and Newtown Creek, there is something that is, again, in reference to polychlorinated biphenyls. Um, you have something called black mayonnaise, which is the consistency of mayonnaise um, and lives at the bottom of the Gowanus Canal in total. Um, it is something that is known to cause cancer and because it, it is all heavy substances, it, it's accumulated into this like gelatinous, um, very gross and toxic uh, substance. So the Gowanus, in, in thinking of that and in thinking of this the state of health as it is now, there are actors who are working to remediate um, both of those super, super fun sites within New York City. And so there, there is acknowledgement of this damage that humans have created. And with that acknowledgement, also the work to figure out how to best um, address, uh, you know, a, basically an environmental catastrophe. Could ever really be cleaned up in the next hundred years even? Or is it just beyond hope? <laughs> I, I mean, I would hope so. I, I think that there are the, the efforts that they're doing in talking of dredging out. So really just like scooping out all of the toxic waste that is present. Present. I think that it is something that we could accomplish within a hundred years. Um, but in, in that thought, I think that it doesn't just happen on its own. And it's really important as, you know, environmentalists, as members of a community to have that voice to make sure that these things are being looked at. Does the water leach into the ground and then come up in people's backyards where they plant, and I used to plant corn and tomatoes, does the water from there escape and leach into other places? So I am not an expert um, in what the water table looks like, uh, but I, I mean, I would recommend if you are gardening within anywhere close to that, using an above bed um, garden. So a raised bed is what I would recommend. Not far. Thanks so much. Sure. All right, I think we're going to wrap up with one last question for you, Issa. Uh, thinking towards the future of our, our waterfront, obviously we have this beautiful park here and it's helped us reconnect, reconnect ourselves um, to the waterway. Uh, what do you see as the biggest challenge or what do you expect to change um, as we think ahead to the next you know, 10, 50, 100 years here on the Brooklyn waterfront? That, that is a good question, and it's also a very big one. Um, I think that, you know, the, the biggest piece for me, and I think with the, the work that we do as educators and as advocates for the environment, is um, bringing people into the fold, right? Because a piece of being an environmental advocate, a piece of being someone that works to protect our waterways and also our, our land that is around us, we can't do that alone, right? And so I, I think that it's incredibly important to communicate to younger generations, to generations that are above us, the value and the import of those ecosystem services. Um, and instead of having it be a conversation point, which I think is important, um, having it be a matter of course and having it be part of discourse and culture of we are environmental activists, not is environmental activ activism a question? That I think is the way in which to move the conversation. So yes, the environment important to protect, that is something that we don't have to explain. The question then, and generationally, the question then is to, how do we further that conversation to turn into action? Great. And um, what do you think is gonna be, when we think about things like sea level rise, how, how might that, how do you think that's gonna like impact us in the waterfront? Now, now, now I'm just curious what your answer is. <laughs> 
Um, I, I think that is also a very challenging question and thank you for asking that. Um, yet to be seen. I think that infrastructure has um, evolved even in the past decade, right? And the interaction that we have with the waterfront may simply be infrastructurally untenable, but that's also a marker. And that's something that visibly and it like, irrefutably is something to demand action. Um, in the conversations of climate change, I think that that is a much larger topic than just talking about the Brooklyn waterfront, but there is evidence and there is visibility that um, things are changing. And I think we are to the point where it's no longer a question of if and when, it's a question of how, how and what do we do. Um, and so I'm thinking of environmental stewardship. What can we actually do? Because it is relatively urgent. So it's more about kind of adapting to what's mm -hmm. anticipated. Well, yeah, adapting your framework, adapting your what your concept is of a paradigm and also how that might impact your behavior and the behavior of generations to come. Great. Uh, well, I want to thank, thank you, everyone, um, for your great questions. Thank you, Issa, for your wonderful presentation and your wealth of knowledge on the Brooklyn Waterfront. I learned myself a few things tonight that I definitely did not know. Uh, I've been sending you guys a lot of interesting links in the chat for more information. I'm going to send one last slew of things. I just want to let everyone know, and I think there were some kids on tonight. So there is a family scavenger hunt and on the waterfront themed scavenger hunt happening at the park this Saturday. Um, feel free to tell any families that you know that might be interested uh, to visit that link. Tonight's recording is on YouTube, so if you have friends that you want to share this with, uh, you can certainly do that. Um, additional, we, we this whole month, we the Ed Center has been celebrating this on the waterfront unit, learning about working waterfronts and how people interact with the waterways. We have a lot of slew of resources online, as well as a ton of events uh, happening in the park. So we hope that we will see you guys again soon for uh, another Conservancy event. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night.